Hello, I'm Sarah Subiata Bennett, your host of the Dallas Express video podcast. Today, I'm honored to have Genevieve Collins, my friend and the state director for Texas and Americans for Prosperity. Her commitment to enhancing our educational landscape exemplifies her role as a formidable advocate striving for a prosperous future in our state. We later explore an unparalleled experience at Flower Mound's EVA, a virtual adventure unlike anything you'll find in America. And it's thrilling for anyone in your group or in your family over 12 years of age. Thank you for joining us. Genevieve, I'm so happy you're here. Today, I particularly wanna pick your brain about everything educational. According to the data, there are 67.7 thousand students, children attending failing and or DNF rated schools in DISD. Would you mind telling our viewers and listeners why this is so important to you? My family comes from generations of people that care about education. My great grandfather was a teacher, mm -hmm. the turn of the 20th century, and ended up investing a lot of his personal time and money in ensuring that kids have a better future. Mm -hmm. We believe across our whole family that every child has gifts and deserves to contribute meaningfully to society, but also deserves the opportunity to have a world-class education. And throughout all of the generations of my family, my dad, when he started getting involved in education policy, it was in the 80s, and he saw that school choice was radioactive. He said, vouchers are politically radioactive. The legislature's never going to pass it. So how can I circumvent the legislature by leveraging technology to give every child a world-class education, regardless of the four walls with which they're within? I have worked with New York City Public Schools, Memphis City Public Schools, Miami, Fort Worth. Uh, I never worked with Dallas ISD, but I've worked all across the country working with administrators, working with teachers to actually help ensure that every child can read and do math on grade level. So this topic is personal because we live in the greatest state and the greatest nation, and Texas students have to be ready to continue a pathway of innovation that we are known for. And part of that is getting the fundamentals right. Could not agree more with you. Can you talk to me and everyone listening about the bureaucracy that is preventing these students from having this chance of having better education? So we have an abundance of school districts across the state. We have superintendents in 1,200 school districts. We have a massive education bureaucracy across 1,200 school districts. That stuff doesn't actually go down to the teachers, to the students. Uh, so there's a system that's kind of set up to protect itself. School districts don't want to um, consolidate. They don't want to, they want to protect their own because usually the school district is the largest employer in a single community. And so they flex and wield a lot of power, which then influences our state legislators, especially in rural communities, to say, well, we don't need to change. We already are doing things the right way. We're already doing things. Why do we need to create more options? In my perspective, Everything that I work for is really about the mental model shift of focusing on the individual child and their capabilities, their, their contribution, their future contributions to our society instead of just protecting a system. What failures in our city have really come into play to even allow this to be the situation that we're seated with, to have so many failing schools? So I think there's a couple things. And first off, I think it's important to say that teachers are doing their absolute best. Absolutely. So this, I want to extract teachers from this conversation because they're, I believe that they're doing their, many of them are of doing course. their real best. Yes. Um, I think one, state testing is an issue. We're teaching to the test and constantly chasing outcomes that are not meeting the needs of the kids. So I think statewide we have 52% of eighth graders and fourth graders are reading at grade level across the state, and 43% are doing math at grade level across the state. Like, the system isn't working, 
And so there's not really, we're not driving innovation. We're kind of continuing the farming system of you can sit, come in for eight hours a day, you sit down in a row, or you have some collaborative learning. Then we do this, we, we have some testing, we do this progress monitoring, but nothing actually is adding up to the outcomes that we're trying to get at. And it's causing college career and military readiness to fail and drop. And so we're and then it's causing you know colleges to spend the first two years of students' lives in remediation. So we're putting this crazy emphasis on these kids being able to test, but we're actually not putting kids into the individualized curriculum that's allowing them to grow and thrive. Uh, and you know everyone has to be able to read, do math. Yes. Absolutely. But we need to be accessing it and, or providing that instruction in a way that is actually unique to the child and can actually help that child grow, not just stay stagnant. Do you think a lot of these parents even know that their kids are attending DNF rated schools or failing schools? Uh, I have two thoughts on that. One, no, I don't think a lot of parents do. And, but two, having been in the state legislature and working with those state reps, Many of them don't think that the parents are capable of knowing, which is shocking to me. Parents are undersold by the school districts and by state reps, saying, well, parents just aren't involved. Mm -hmm. well, sometimes parents are too busy. Sometimes families are working multiple jobs. That's true. But they're doing that because they want the best for their child. And so to disqualify a parent saying, well, they don't have access, they don't know how to figure out what the resources are, they don't know this, that, or the other, is I think that's putting parents down. Mm -hmm. And we should be empowering parents more than anything because we know that when a parent is involved in their child's education, educational outcomes are better. Parents deserve to have a voice and to not have their voice be minimized by the school district, state reps, or even other folks in, in the districts. Parents deserve the, the opportunity to say what's best for their child because fundamentally, first and foremost, always, parent is the primary educator of their child. We've abdicated that a little bit, yep. uh, and it's time for parents to reclaim that right. You kind of segued a little bit from the financial barriers. Can you touch upon that? Sure. So private school is expensive. Uh, absolutely. <laughs> absolutely. I mean, it's expensive in Dallas. You know, mm -hmm. these top tier for schools sure. are in, in order of magnitude, thousands of dollars. Private school isn't always the answer. Mm -hmm. Public charter schools are wonderful. Homeschool, that's a huge sacrifice. So there's all sorts of trade-offs here, but the financial barrier shouldn't be the barrier for a child to have the, a world-class education that best meets their needs. Mm -hmm. And I think a lot of the argument around school choice gets lost, and it's this battle between public versus private. From Americans for Prosperity, for myself, I want to see the entire array of options. And that's what we should be thinking in an individualized and personalized approach. You know, so this year in the Texas legislature, the governor uh, wanted to pass education savings accounts. Mm -hmm. It was looking at how do we use our tax dollars, because all of our tax dollars help pay for school mm -hmm. and school districts. So you should be able, to, you're a paying citizen with a child, you should be able to have your dollars follow your student. I personally believe your money, tax dollars, it's not government money, it's your money. Uh, I wish more people shared that same belief mm -hmm. or realize like the government doesn't have money, they use our money. And so with education savings accounts, this would really support low-income families. It would prioritize low-income families. It would prioritize students with disabilities. And it would ensure that ch children trapped in failing public schools have the resources to go somewhere else. And why is this not being supported across the board? Well, because I, I, during the Texas legislature, I'll, I'll share a couple of thoughts. I was meeting with multiple state reps. I mean, I was constantly walking the Capitol. Mm -hmm. And I would hear from rural Republican members, uh, my school, my district doesn't want this. I don't hear anything about this. And I thought, well, that's odd. Because I actually know a lot of people in East Texas or in West Texas. Mm -hmm. We have offices in the areas. And I thought, well, if your community isn't talking to you, let me make sure you're hearing from them. I will bring them to your office. And we did. We brought 1,200 people to the Capitol in the span of five weeks from across the state of Texas. And, and we had kids, like in San Antonio, we had kids that are very low-income kids that go to a private school. Mm -hmm. It's 
$385 a month, mm -hmm. Sunnybrook Academy. Yeah. And this little girl, she told the chairman of the House Education Committee, she said, what an education savings account would do, it would help me see my mom. Oh, my oh. God. It imp her comment imprinted on my heart. She goes, my mom works five days a week, and on the weekends she cleans houses to pay for my education. I want to, this is what she said, Sarah, I want to recognize my mom and her effort, which is why I'm coming up here, because this I recognize what my mom's sacrifices are. It's why I work so hard in school. And I want to recognize her and give her time off. And I want to spend time with my mom. Okay, now I'm, I'm here crying. I know. <laughs> you know, but it's, it's, but it's the truth. It's the truth. It's the truth. And so what's been interesting is that the whole argument last year during the legislature was that, well, if we create a $500 million fund mm -hmm. that would allow for let's just say 50,000 kids to have access to this program that would prioritize low-income kids, kids with disabilities, um, but create a statute that would allow any child past those, those criteria to have access to this account, mm -hmm. that $500 million was going to defund public schools. Now, so that's the argument. That's the argument. So let me just put this also in perspective from a financial <laughs> perspective. So we currently spend $75 billion I'm aware. on education, on public, public schools. schools. Uh -huh. So you're talking less than half of 1% mm -hmm. of a fund to be created for students in low-income communities and students with disabilities to have access to money to go to the schools of their choice instead of being trapped in failing public schools. So less than half of a percent. Okay. I guess my question is also from a financial perspective, how much more money do you need, mm -hmm. right? Okay, there's a, there's a component about teacher pay. Mm -hmm. I think that needs to be put on, on the table side here. We, we want to pay, yes, we want to value teachers. they need teachers. to be they well They need paid. to be well paid. Yes. We, we want to incentivize great teachers. But $75 billion to have the outcomes of 52% of our eighth graders and fourth graders reading on grade level, and 43% of our eighth graders and fourth graders doing math on grade level at a cost of $75 billion. The, the political part of this, for, in my opinion, it's not about kids, it's about the money and how much more money is gonna really be needed to get the outcomes that we want. If tech, I believe, and this is just a little bit separate, but go with me here. I'm gonna go out and take yeah, you on yeah, a journey. I'm following. <laughs> I believe that Texas is not just the Lone Star State. I believe it's the innovation state. We've got, in, ta in Dallas alone, 32,000 financial services jobs. Dallas is the second largest city with financial services jobs outside of New York City. You've got NASA, Blue Origin, and SpaceX all here. You've got the Boring Company. You've got a, finan or you've got a technology sector in Austin. You've got energy, an entire energy sector that you know, whether it's creating fracking or liquefied natural gas, Texas is creating all these incredible innovations. Mm -hmm. And we should be focusing on waterfalling this innovation down into our schools, regardless of the type of school, that our school systems should be so innovative, so, so curious, and provide kids so many options to explore that by the time they graduate, they are more prepared than ever before to continue the innovation. Mic drop. <laughs> <laughs> Mic drop, because I mean, it's the truth. I, I, I love that because it's, I am working, you are working very hard to change this narrative for our future, yeah. for the students, for people living here, people moving here. And let's speak about that for just a quick second sure. if we can. Um, people are moving here in droves, right? And it's going to be applying more pressure to a bunch of these school systems. Yeah. How will Dallas respond? How will the state respond? Especially because a lot of these are in more affordable areas to live, right? Yeah. I'm talking about the DNF schools particularly. Yeah. How will we be able to respond without, without passing said legislation? I, d I don't know. I truly don't. I mean, there are 1,300 people moving to Texas every day from all across the country. People are seeing the systems and the economy in Dallas as interesting and a place that they want to move to. 
but yet when they actually peel back the layers, our, most of downtown Dallas is empty. Everyone's our moving to the suburbs. Our taxes are too high. Suburbs have better schooling options. That's right. And, and, and housing is more affordable. So mm-hmm. I don't know if Dallas is actually going to respond because they're not. Mm-hmm. And that's, that's from the top to bottom. Uh, so I don't know how the city responds, but the city has to shake itself awake and say, wait a second, we're supposed to, this DFW Metroplex is supposed to be the largest city or the largest area in the country in the next hundred years, right? We're going to surpass New York City. That's right. Right? So we better get our rears in gear now, Mm -hmm. figure out our education practices, our infrastructure, our housing, our healthcare systems. We got to get our rears in gear now and create the baseline for a prosperous, innovative future because it's coming here and we don't want to get left behind because we're trying to protect a system. Absolutely. Thank you for joining me in the fight in preserving the the beauty that is DFW. Yes. I believe that we will be successful. Yes. We'll just get the word out. We'll embolden more people. And I appreciate you for being here. I appreciate you. Bravo you. to you being Thank in you. the arena. Now come with me on a unique adventure right in our own backyard. EVA Flower Mound stands as the sole experience of its kind in America, as an extraordinary virtual reality esports arena that defies belief. Prepare to witness it yourself as we dive into the world of EVA. All right, EVA, esports virtual arenas. So this is the only of its kind in the country, yes. right? Yes, the rest are in Europe and France. Yeah. Uh, we'll be opening up more here coming soon in the next couple months. As far as like uh, arcade games go and all yeah. that, we have 7,000 on each arcade machine. Completely complimentary to play as well. Darts in that back corner and then foosball and cornhole in this kind of bar area yeah. over here. Yeah. And then this is the briefing room where we'll get you all briefed. We have lockers you can put your stuff in if you want. After that. For your game or after the game, you're more than welcome to hang out in our lounge area over here. This is fabulous! Shannon, I'm so happy right now. This is like heaven. And she said I'm gonna sweat. Yeah, get ready. Good thing I worked out this morning. <laughs> oh, zombies. You wanna do zombies? Can we switch to zombies? <laughs> See, this is why I bring Ashley. Because yeah. she's we're the same. We're like, we'll do whatever. Whatever, like. Time it up. Time it up. Uh-huh. Um. Hey, Sarah, I see you. Oh my god. Oh! Oh my god! Oh! He's huge! He's yep. huge! He's enormous! I see bigger! Yeah, let's go have the beer now. <laughs> okay, I appreciated the leadership. Yes, thank you. Thank you, was. assassin. <laughs> that was awesome. It was. Oh my God. Oh my God. Oh my God. I wasn't kidding, that was a workout. That was fun. That was a workout, that was, that was so fun. Oh my God, okay, oh, I, I we love have that. to bring kids. Right? going uh-huh. all the time, so it's like they'll be constantly, there's no boredom, they're out of breath. Uh, no, that's why I was like, these guys are just getting all <laughs> Because you turn around and they were like, they're right there. there, they're swarming so you. how are you supposed oh, to? It's impossible, oh. it's impossible. I know. We both have torn L4 and L5 discs. <laughs> Anyone can play. Oh my <laughs> God. Anyone. Cheers. Cheers. Cheers.